I've got so much like so much to share with you today that um, if you're a note taker, I fear you will get carpal tunnel. That's how much I've got today. So here's what I, I want you to do. Um, I just want you to go ahead and resolve in your mind. You're going to take it how, how you can, and you're going to go back and watch it later to get all you can, uh, because I, I just have so much for you today. If you want a core passage, we're going to be in Mark chapter 13. Um, if you're new to our church, thank you so much for being here. And let me just tell you, we're in an unusual series uh, called the end. And it's, it's actually, I'm, I'm diving into uh, what the Bible says about the end of the world. So this is going to be a little bit of graduate level stuff today, uh, but I promise I'm going to try to make it as easy as possible for you to understand um, because I want you to go along this journey with us. Now, I want to start today with a pop quiz, and, um, and here's the quiz. I'm going to give you three statements, and I want you to tell me what they have in common. The first statement is, godliness is next to cleanliness, okay? The second one is, God will never give you more than you can bear. Okay, so you're catching on. Um, and then the last one is this, is that God helps those who help themselves, right? So what do those three uh, statements have in common? Well, here's what they are. They're the most well-known scriptures that aren't scriptures, Okay, um, th there is this common idea that each one of those things is in the Bible, but I hate to break it to you, it's not. Um, none of those are in the Bible, but it, I, I do that pop quiz as an illustration to show you how easy it is to believe something people claim is in the scriptures that ain't actually in the scriptures. And I bring that up to say that's the reason we're doing this series, because there is no single topic more formed by misinformation than the end times. I mean, we got people who are, who are spouting fear when God clearly says, I don't work through fear. We've got people who are predicting dates when God clearly says, no one knows the dates. We've got people who say, I have special insight through numerology, astrology, revised history. And scripture says that God has made it plain so that all of us can participate in his plan. So um, my heart is this, I'm no expert, but I do want you to be able to take your newspaper and your Bible and see them beside each other and be able to tell if somebody is giving you misinformation, bad teaching, false teaching. I, I want you to also see the beauty that it is you have a God who has not just ordered your steps, but has ordered the steps of history for our good and to be with him. Okay, so that, that's the heart of this series. And today I wanna just, I wanna jump into a question that is so common and reasonable, you've asked it. Here's the question, how do we know we are in the end times? Like, like how, do we, how can we be sure this season is actually that? Well, listen, one of, your, uh, one of the realities is this, that, that it's a reasonable question because Jesus' disciples himself asked, uh, themselves asked it. As a matter of fact, Mark 13, is, is later Jesus said on the Mount of Olives, across the valley from the temple, this is in Jerusalem, Peter, James, and John, and Andrew came to him privately. That, they didn't want to ask a dumb question in front of everybody and get made fun of, so they came privately. And they asked him, tell us when will all this happen? What sign will show us that these things, these things means the end of the world, what sign's going to show that these things are about to be fulfilled? Now, when my, my uh, I don't know about you, but my family used to go on these road trips and, um, and, 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 you know, it didn't look like today. Like, I don't think my parents cared if we wore seat belts. Um, I, I don't, we didn't have GPSs. We didn't have a bunch of screens. It was just you and a windshield for a long time, right? And, um, and, and as a matter of fact, we used this ancient technology called MapQuest to, uh, to figure out how to get one place to another. Um, you, you would print it off on, on paper, and it was kind of turn by turn. Well, um, we'd get going down the road, and, and, you know, I'd eat all my snacks within the the first hour and then I was bored, you know, and I would ask, are we there yet? How long is this going to take? Are we there yet? Well, my dad, I guess, got tired of hearing me ask those questions. So here's what he did. He taught me to read a map and he taught me to look for mile markers. Okay. So, so here, here's what he did. He said, the map will show you the overall path. The mile markers tell you how fast we're getting there or the pace. Your heavenly father's done the exact same thing in scripture. He said, I'm going to give you the overall map, the events that are going to happen, the sequence, if you will, that will lead to the, the end. I want you to see the big journey, but I also want to give you some signs that show you how fast we're heading that way. 
Okay, and, and so sequence is the very first thing he gives us. And if you are wanting a general sequence of like a big overarching events after event of the end times, here's what it would be. Um, it, w- it would be this. It would start, in my opinion, with the rapture. Now, this is a, a bit of a debated kind of thing. And so here's what I want to give you a preview for next week. Next week's message is 100% on the rapture. If you've ever been confused by it, you don't think it's going to happen, you're excited for it, you need to be here next week because the whole message is on the rapture. Okay, But let, let's assume, though, that, the, that this is in order. After the rapture, the Antichrist, you've probably heard that term, this is a, a leader who will be so charismatic and, and people will be so drawn to him because of events leading up that he'll be able to lead the world as a one-world government. And he'll be able to pull all nations under his agenda. And, um, and then that's going to start a period of time called the tribulation. It's seven years according to scripture. Now, the first three and a half years are going to be great. It's going to seem like we found the guy that, 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 I mean, he's perfect. He can do, he seems like he's almost got divine nature to his leadership. But at three and a half years, he's going to then claim he's divine and it's going to start a, a basically an unraveling of society. We're talking plagues and wars and just some ugly, ugly stuff. At the end of that seven years, Scripture says Jesus himself will come. There will be a second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the same way he came the first time, he's coming back the second time. But this time, he, he's not coming to leave. He's coming to stay. And he's going to set up a millennial reign, which means a thousand year reign. It means for a thousand years, he's going to show us what it should have been like to begin with. Like all the way back to the Garden of Eden, minus the fig leaves, we're going to have what he intended the world to actually be like. And then there's going to be one final rebellion from Satan, and there's going to be one big end war that's going to be over with, and then we get to spend the eternity, those who are following Jesus, we get to spend heaven on earth with him, okay? So this is the sequence, this is the path, this is the overall, okay? But he didn't just, that's only one piece of the puzzle. Where we're going and the events, the chain link, that's just one piece. The other part is, how fast are we heading this way? Um, It's not just about the map, it's the mile markers or the pace, well, in, in order to give us the, the pace, Scripture gives us something called signs. There, there are these, these things that show us, hey, when this starts happening, it's speeding up. And then when you see this, it's speeding up. There are things in Scripture that are being lived out in contemporary society. Now, for 2,000 years since Jesus left, there have been a lot of signs. Famines, wars, um, ethnic uh, civil wars, all kinds of stuff that he predicted. But listen... For the last 75 years, your generation has seen things that no other generation for the previous 2000 have seen. Let me say it this way. It's getting fast. Like we're speeding through some things that people waited centuries to see that are happening in your generation. And so today what I want to do is I want to reduce it down to three, three signs that you've seen in your newspaper read in your history book, and you didn't realize Jesus himself predicted them as markers of his coming. Okay, so here's the first one. It centers around the nation of Israel. Um, a c- couple weeks ago, we, we celebrated Independence Day here in America, which means we, we, we celebrated our nation. And, um, and, and I don't know how you did that. Some people, hamburgers, hot dogs, fireworks. How, how many hamburger people do I have? How, how many hamburger people? Okay, good. How many hot dog people? Hot dog people? Okay, Seems like some of y'all are vegan, I guess. I I don't know, but uh, nonetheless, we celebrated. Now, listen, as much as we love our country, here's the reality. When it comes to God's plan for the end times, there's only one nation that's at the center, and it's the nation of Israel. Now, now, here's why. You may say, well, why Israel? Well, there's a couple markers. First of all, Israel is the only nation that God ever founded. You can read about that in Genesis chapter 12. It's the only nation he ever created himself. In addition, he holds a covenant with them, which is, which is like a promise that's beyond a promise. It is a, a, a blood pact. I mean, it's like, I'm not going anywhere. I will always be your God, regardless of if you choose me or not. And so he is committed to Israel. In addition to that, Israel has made the greatest contributions to society of any, any nation. Think about it. They gave us Jesus. They gave us the Bible. And they gave us the church. Okay, so they gave us the most important person, the most important book, and the most important organization on the dawn of human history. 
So, so, so Israel is just the super sign. When you see stuff happening in Israel, you know something's happening in God's calendar. Now, there are actually four predictions God's made about Israel that you've seen just in, I mean, people have been waiting centuries to see this stuff, and it's just happened in the last 75 years. Here's the first one. Um, Israel is regathered twice. So here's what it means. They're dispersed as a nation, losing their, their national homeland, and then they're brought back together, not once, twice. First time it happened is they went into Babylonian captivity and then they were regathered. You can read about it, or the prediction is in Isaiah 11. They were regathered in 586 BC. It happened a second time that they were dispersed from their homeland. It became Palestine. And then in 1948, they were regained or regathered to become the modern day nation of Israel that we know today. Now, now listen, I, I don't know that you fully appreciate how divine this is, the idea that a people group could retain their national identity after losing their homeland for even 300 years has never happened. It's never happened for 500 years. I mean, consider this. Have you ever met a Moabite? You ever met a Hittite? You ever met an Ammonite? No, you haven't met them. These were once vast empires that we know history that they were here, and you can't find one. Listen, Israel, in spite of 2,000 years, has maintained, the Jewish people have maintained their national identity and have been regathered multiple times keeping that. That's divine. Now, here's the, here's the second one. Israel will be, is a nation that will be born in a day. Listen, kingdoms evolve over generations. Nations emerge over time. They evolve. Um, you can open a business on the internet in a day. You can't start a nation in a day. But did you know that in, um, in 1948, Great Britain's rule over Palestine ended, the day it ended, the Jewish agency, it was like a political party, founded the nation of Israel and immediately was recognized by the UN and the United States. In one day, they went from having no nation to being a nation. In one day, an ancient people became a modern nation in one day. I mean, that's never happened. Okay, let, let me show you another one. Jerusalem will be retaken by the Jews. It's predicted in Luke 21. Well, in 1948, they went back to and began to retake Palestine. But listen, they didn't get Jerusalem until 1967. In 1967, there was a six-day war. And at the end of the six-day war, the Jewish people regained Jerusalem as their capital city. And it's remained in their hands even till today. That was predicted in scripture. Then, then look at this. The land of Israel will be divided and anti-Semitism will be increased. Joel predicts this. Thousands of years ago, it was predicted that after they get back, that, that all of a sudden the land is going to start to be sliced up and you're going to see people rise again against, in a way against the Jewish people. Well, listen, the UN has continued to press them on Gaza, on the West Bank, on the Sinai Peninsula, and it's been sliced off and sliced off and sliced off. They have lost land since 1948. And in addition to that, Tel Aviv University in 2001 came up with a, a study and said that, that anti Semitic acts are at an all-time high in human history. That means it's more common than during the Holocaust. And it's not just in the Middle East, it's all over the world. As a matter of fact, um, there's more Jewish people in the United States than, than anywhere else besides Israel, and, and it's nearly doubled since 2020 aggression towards Jewish people. And this happened in France, the United Kingdom, Canada, all over the world, the Jewish people are being, being persecuted. And guess why? Because it was predicted. Now, so, so, so let, let, let me just say this. Let, let's just review. Israel will be scattered. Thousands of proph prophecies that have shown us over a thousand years. Israel will be scattered. Did that happen? Check. Yep. They're going to be regathered twice. Did that happen? Check. They're going to regain their capital city. Did that happen? Check. They're going to be born in a day. Did that happen? Check. That they're, they're going to be isolated and attacked? Check. And that eventually a northern country will come and try to invade them. Invade them. Has that happened yet? No, but I think if you watch the news, you can see it happening pretty easily. Okay? Now, now listen. That, all these things are happening, these signs, and they've only been happening in your generation. 
So, so let me say this. That's why it's sobering when we read Jesus's words from 2,000 years ago. Look, this, Jesus said this. Now learn a lesson from the fig tree. The fig tree was a type and shadow. It's, he's talking about the, the nation of Israel. Learn a lesson from the fig tree when its branches bud and its leaves begin to sprout. He's saying when it becomes a nation again, you know that summer is near. And in the same way, when you see all these things taking place, you can know that his return is, will you help me with these two words? Very near. Not near, very near. Right at the door. Right at the door. And all of that's happened in your time. Let, let me show you the second one. Um, innovation. Here's what the book of Daniel says about the end times. It says, but as for you, Daniel, conceal these words and seal up the book until the end of time. Many will go back and forth and knowledge will increase. So, so here's what the prediction is, that there's going to be an innovation explosion during the end times. So for years, we've seen obviously modern history become uh, more technologically advanced, but you would not believe the pace that's been happening in your generation. Let, let me show you travel. He says, well, people are going to go to and fro. For thousands of years, people could only travel 10 to 20 miles in a day because they were either walking or on horse. Okay. But at the beginning of the 19th century, the train comes into play. Then the car, the car turns it from tens of miles to hundreds of miles. But then in 1960, it becomes common for people to travel on what? Airplanes. Most of the people sitting in this room listening to me right now, you've went thousands of miles. I mean, you can get on a plane today and be in Hong Kong in less than 20 hours. But you know what they've been doing in the last few, few years? They've been booking commercial flights to space. To space. It's it, fast. Okay, look, look at this. Knowledge will increase. Um, in, in 1982, a guy named Buckminster Fuller, what a name, right? I mean, he, his mama must not love him. Uh, Buckminster Fuller, he developed what's called the knowledge curve. Here's what it does. It measures the cumulative or estimates the cumulative knowledge all of humanity has. And what he basically said is up to 1900, um, that knowledge doubled, the, what we knew doubled about every century. So it took 100 years for us to learn as much as we had, came into that century learning. World War II, though, it exploded. Tsunami of knowledge to the fact that it sped it up after World War II because of globalization to, that they believed knowledge doubles once every 25 years. But then what came next? The internet. There are 50 billion interconnected devices today. In 2020, IBM did an estimate, and here's what they say. Human knowledge doubles every 12 hours. Faster. Okay, look, look, look at this. Nuclear warfare. This is something that, that, that maybe you're not considered. Let me show you something written nearly 1,400 years ago. Zechariah, Old Testament book. This is the plague with which the Lord will strike all the nations that fought against Jerusalem. So he's talking about this end times battle. Their flesh will rot while they are still standing on their feet. Their eyes will rot in their sockets and their tongues will rot in their mouths. And on that day, people will be stricken by the Lord with great panic. Now, now let me just say, this is probably not the verse hanging on your refrigerator. Right, I mean, this isn't, this isn't the one you committed to memory. You know, let, let me encourage myself today. Uh, uh, that's probably not what this is. Okay, for, listen to me. For centuries, scholars, they're like, what does this mean? What does this mean? What does that even look like? Until nuclear warfare. Did you know that if you're within a nuclear blast, within one second, the heat goes from zero degrees to 150 million degrees Fahrenheit? So let me say it this way. If you're in a nuclear blast before your body hits the ground, it's been stripped of its flesh. 1,400 years before. Look, look, look at this. Um, two witnesses will be murdered. So during the tribulation period, the Bible says that God will send two witnesses, two, they're, they're, old, they're kind of Old Testament figures who will come and proclaim Jesus as king. And they're going to come against the Antichrist and they're going to have divine acts. And, and it, there's a lot going on there. But here's what it says. Because they raise themselves against the Antichrist, he'll have them killed. And in, in, in response to them being killed, the Bible says that he's going to leave their bodies laying out where people can see it so that as you will not come against me. That the, almost like the way uh, Stalin or Hitler would display people. Okay, so here's the scripture that predicts it. Revelation 11, 9. And for, and for three and a half days, all people, 
all tribes, all languages, all nations will stare at their bodies. For centuries, scholars have went, how's that possible? Because even if you're thinking television, television cannot reach every place. But about 10 years ago, all of a sudden we came up with broadcasting through social media. You remember there was an Arab Spring some years ago in, in countries that suppress the television, uh, the television channels, we were seeing what was happening because of the phone in people's hands. Today, something could happen anywhere in the world and most of the world could see it through their phones. Okay, now, now listen, most of the time, science is thought to be an opposition of faith. But I'm just telling you, as I studied this out, science is not in opposition to faith. They're partners in God's end time plan. I mean, I didn't even talk about chip technology, the global digital economics, um, artificial intelligence, cloning, all that are, are pointed to in scripture. As a matter of fact, I go as far to say this, the scientists don't disagree with the preachers. The scientists and the preachers are on the same page. Let me show it to you. Um, in 1945, uh, a University of Chicago scientist developed something called the Doomsday Clock. The Doomsday Clock is a way for them to simply communicate science's estimation of when the world will end. And it's, it's a clock face, and, and if, if it gets to midnight, it's over. Okay, is what, what the science says. When it gets to midnight, the world's gonna end. And, and they take political issues, technological issues, cultural issues, and they, they make these educated hypotheses. Well, since, since the time of its dawning, it's only, the time's only moved 19 times. In 2010, it was six minutes to midnight. If you Google it today, you know what it's gonna tell you? It's 100 seconds to midnight. That's what science thinks. Okay, now here, here's the last one, immorality. Um, you would have to be living off the grid to have not seen this one. Like, like I don't know, maybe this has happened for you. I've watched the news recently and I'm like, have we lost our minds? I, I mean, have we just lost our minds? And, and now, it's not surprising to you that immorality in all its forms are increasing. What may be surprising to you is the Bible predicted all of it. Uh, Second Timothy, this is Paul writing to a young pastor. You should know this, Timothy, that in the last days, there will be very difficult times. For people will love only themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God disobedient to their parents, ungrateful. They will be considered, they will consider nothing sacred anymore. Look at this. They will be unloving and unforgiving. You, you've, been on, you've been on 270 recently? Prophecy, right before your eyes. <laughs> they will slander others, social media, anybody, um, and have no self-control. They'll be cruel and hate what is good. They'll betray their friends, be reckless, puffed up with pride. They'll love pleasure rather than God. They will act religious. They're gonna act like they're spiritual, but they're gonna reject the real power of God that could actually make them godly. Now, now listen, I want you to see this, have no self-control. So I, I, I didn't know this. I learned this about this passage. It looks like when you read it in English, it looks like this is just one of the symptoms, no self-control. But the way the original language is constructed, this is the central issue. And let me say it this way. A lack of self-control is the root. Everything else I read you is just the fruit. They're basically saying unique to the end times is our culture will have no self-control. It's the word incontinent. It means a group of people or a, or a, a, a nation, a person even, who has let go of all restraint and is just doing whatever they want to do, okay? Now, now listen, think about our culture and think about that definition. No restraint for spending. No restraint for substances. No restraint for anger and outbursts. No restraint for sexual appetite. No restraint for respecting other people. No restraint for 
self-aggrandizement and self-promoting. If there's anything our culture is, it's without self-restraint. Now, now listen, and it, you say, well, why is this happening uniquely right now? Well, he tells us it's because people have a form of godliness, but they actually don't have any spiritual power. Okay, so, so, so the, in the original language, you know what that's a picture of? Here's what it would describe. It would be like a mannequin dressed like a priest. So, so what they're saying is from a distance, it looks spiritual. But when you get up close to it, you can tell it's hollow and has no real life. Listen, you want to know why there's a lessening of self-control in our culture? It's because there's a limiting of the Holy Spirit's work in the lives of people. The one of the fruit of the Holy Spirit is self control. The more we push him out, the less restraint we have personally. And what it's left us with is we act like we have it together, dressing up in fake clothes, acting like we're moral, acting like we have our own truth, talking like we're spiritual. But the proof is in our life when we, our homes are broken and we're addicted and we can't be healed from past pain and we struggle to get along through racial unrest and we can't find leaders who have any integrity. It's because we're advertising you can't do it without the Holy Spirit. You need his work to even walk a day in restraint. We need him. He's the source of our joy. He's the source of our peace. Without him, we can do nothing. And our lives advertise it like a mannequin selling a life that says, hey, you need the Holy Spirit. Now listen, when you hear a message like this, it's like a spiritual acid test for your faith. We're going to find out real quick what you believe. Jesus said it this way in Mark 13. He says, but about that day or hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven nor the sun. He's saying, I don't even know when I'm coming back. God, our heavenly father is the only one that knows it. And, and by the way, the only reason that it hadn't all wrapped up yet Peter says is because God is slow intentionally hoping more people come to know Christ. That, listen, he, you don't think he looks at the pain in this world and goes, let's wrap this thing up. But he says, wait, 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 don't go, don't go. There's one more. There's one more. There's one more. His love for us is what informs the end times. So he says, we don't know when it's going to be, but you better be on guard. Be alert. You don't know when that time will come. And then Jesus says, okay, I'm going to tell you what it's going to be like. He says, it's like a man going away. He leaves his house and puts his servants in charge. In this, Jesus is the, is the owner of the house. Okay. We're the servants. He puts them in charge, each with their assigned task. You have an assigned task. And he tells one, uh, he tells them, you better keep watch at the door Therefore, keep watch because you don't know when the owner of the house is going to come back. And, and, and it goes on to say, whether it's in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or at dawn, what you don't want to have happen is he comes suddenly and you're sleeping. Okay, so, so here's what he's saying. When I come back, here's what's going to happen. There are going to be two outlooks, one bad, one good. Bad is people are going to be asleep. Good is they're going to be stewarding what I entrusted to them. So, so let me say, if, if you're in the sleepy category, what that means is not that you're physically sleeping. It means you're just spiritually sleeping. Like you're so distracted with this world and business and family and soccer games and, 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 and Facebook. You're just asleep spiritually. You're not even aware that at any moment the owner could show back up. And, and, and l let me say it this way. Um, many of you may know Kayla's favorite place on the, in the, the planet is Disney World. Um, she thinks it's magical. I think it's robbery. Okay. You ever wonder why Mickey's always smiling? It's because of how much everything costs. Okay. Dirty rat. But anyways, listen, um, her favorite ride is it's a small world. You know the one I'm talking about? All them little creepy half high things that sing to you for about 15 minutes. Um, now, sh when you're on It's a Small World, it's easy. I mean, you just hang back, they sing, you, you take pictures, you can have a conversation. The, the pace is so slow, you're not gonna miss anything. I've actually taken naps on It's a Small World. <laughs> True. My favorite ride is Space Mountain. 
Space Mountain, you better lean in. We're going fast and furious. The turns come quick. You, 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 better, you better be ready. If you try to take a nap on Space Mountain, you're going to wake up and your head and body no longer connected. Okay? Here's all I'm saying. I've studied this. I'm telling you, I've, studied, I've got way more than I'm sharing with you today, and I'm sharing a lot. Here's what I would tell you. The signs are moving at a Space Mountain speed, but most people have a small world outlook. Are we in the last days? I think so. But regardless of if that's true, you're in your last days. Come on, whether Jesus comes back or not, you're going to go see him. You need to wake up. You, you need to wake up. Listen, you need to stop giving your life to stuff that does not matter in the life that is to come. Your time here is so small compared to eternity. And you need to prioritize. And for the rest of us who, who are awake, we need to steward. Jesus, listen, Jesus didn't say, I'm going to come back and some are sleeping and some are building bomb shelters. He says, I come back and people are at work. They're not just surviving. They're excited at my work. And I know that's tough when you look at history. We get scared. Matter of fact, um, you know, so what you see through history is some people stewarded their generation, worked hard, and some people go to sleep. Some people, they just want to survive. Just put your head down. Wait till it's all over. Matter of fact, I found this quote uh, by a pastor. Let me read it to you. Look how the glory is gone. Some of you can remember 50 years ago when churches were in the, their glory, saying, you remember the good old days. What a change there has been. In those days, people were converted and willingly declared what God had done in their souls. But conversions have now become rare in this day, and the glory is gone. The sp special mark of God's providence in this country seems now to be over and we're just gonna weep to think about it. Now, now here's what you may find surprising. This was not written recently. This was written in 1702. You know why? Because it, there's this, this pattern that happens where spiritual decline starts and then there's a group of people who just decide, let's just put our head down and survive. But there's also a group of people who say, nope, we're going to work as stewards. 1702, spiritual decline everywhere. Fledgling colonies here in America, but a group of people in Scotland decided we're going to pray and we're going to believe God for something great. We're going to steward our generation. Well, what they started praying, the passion that was birthed, it went across the pond and came to the 13 colonies. And a guy named Thomas Freeling started going out. In, he's a pastor. He went out in a field and he started preaching passionately. And all of a sudden, the crowds started growing in the field and hundreds and thousands of people came to know the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's called the First Great Awakening, a revival that swept through, through the United States. And historians will tell you it was such a cementing event that it's what prepared us to go in to a battle for our independence, that we were founded on a spiritual fervor right before we entered into it. But then a hundred years passed and decline started again. Matter of fact, Chief Justice um, John Marshall said that the church is beyond being redeemed. Voltaire, a, a philosopher said that within 30 years, every church will be boarded up. They did a study on Harvard University's um, campus and couldn't find one believer and I'm sure there were people in the church that said, let's just put our head down, survive. Let's, but there was a group of people in Cane Ridge, Kentucky, who said, nope, we're going to steward our calling. We're going to steward this generation. And they began a small prayer meeting that grew to a large prayer meeting, moved up the East Coast and went to Hampton Sydney College. And it birthed the second great awakening. What God did there is hundreds of thousands of people came to know the Lord Jesus all across our nation, and it also birthed the abolition movement, which eventually saw the end of slavery in our nation. But then another hundred years passed, and things again started to digress. And people started to say, well, the church is over with. There's nothing done. It, the church was relegated to, 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 to the far ends of society. But there were six men who said, nope, nope, nope. We're going to steward. We're going to steward. Six men on Fulton Street in New York City began to pray. 
They were joined by 10, then they grew to 20, then they grew to 50, then they grew to 100, then they grew to 1,000. Their prayer meeting caught fire, and you should Google it. There are pictures of 10,000 men standing up the streets of New York City praying and crying out to God because they wanted to steward their generation. Listen, it caused the third great awakening, and it swept through the Midwest, and it swept through the Northeast. It, 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 city crusades took place. Millions of people came to know the Lord Jesus Christ. It reshaped the whole landscape through denominations and, and movements. And listen, at the end of it, the greatest missionary endeavor on the world has ever seen. More people went to more nations than at any other time in history because people decided, I'm going to steward my generation. There's been other few movements, but here we are, a little over 100 years later. Spiritual decline is at an all-time high. People are ready to build shelters. I'm just telling you, there's a group of people in St. Louis who said, God's still got to move for this place. And we're passionate for his word and we're prayerful for his return. And we're going to pour our love into this city. Listen, I, there's a group of people. I know them. I see them every week that say our best days are not behind us. There's still a move of God ahead of us. And God's not coming back for a small, broken, bent up church. He's coming for a passionate, working, stewarding group of people. Now's the time to serve. Now's the time to share your faith. Now is the time to worship more fervently than you've ever worshiped. Now is the time for you to reap prioritize your time and to go after the Lord because a revival is coming and then Jesus is coming. He's coming back for a church on fire. And I'm just saying, why not here? Why not us? Why not now? Why not this place to see another awakening happen before the return of the Lord Jesus Christ? I'm not content to sleep. We're just getting started in what God wants to do in us, through you, in your family, in your businesses. But we've got to have a heart for him that's at work for what he's doing in our lives. Come on, stand to your feet this morning. Stand to your feet. Hey, what's going on, everybody? I hope you enjoyed this message you just heard. For more information and other content, go ahead and hit that subscribe button and hit that bell icon as well so you can be notified every time we upload something new on our channel. Now, while you're here, go ahead and check out past messages and other videos, and we'll see you next time.